Yes. Hi, everyone. So my name is Murtuj, and I'm a graduate student at Portland State University. I'm doing my PhD. Uh, so uh, this was part of my research, uh, PhD research at Portland State University. And the title of my presentation is Full Scale Evaluation of a Repair Measure of an Arctic Damage Bridge Column Using External Dissipator Devices. And uh, um, my supervisor, I work with my supervisor, Peter Dusika. He's a professor at Portland State University. Uh, both of our email address and uh, are here. So in case if you want to reach out to me after the presentation, you can do so. And this project was funded by Oregon Department of Transportation. And we tested all the specimens in our lab uh, at uh, Portland State University, which is also known as ISTA Lab. So before I start with the repair process or anything, I just want to uh, go ahead with the background and the main, uh, motivation why we started this project. So you can see on the left side, there is a map uh, for seismic uh, hazard that will happen after the Cascade subduction zone. The state of Oregon in the United States is uh, as a looming threat of Cascadia subduction zone earthquake uh, resulting from the Cascadia fault zone that is lying on the west side of the state. And uh, this, is, uh, this is a probability of uh, having a magnitude 9 earthquake. So that's a huge earthquake that we're expecting. And it might happen any day because it has a return period of 300 years. And the last Cascadia subduction earthquake happened uh, uh, more than 300 years before. So in this map, you can see that these are the simulative scenarios of damages that we might expect if uh, magnitude 9 a cascade of subduction earthquake happens. And as we go to the western part of the state, uh, it, the damages will get severe and severe. And the major highway route in Oregon uh, is uh, interested I-5, I-5 route. And it lies within the zone where we are expecting that there will be severe to moderate damages. And also one of the fact is that these damages will be spread geographically, geographically all over the state. So it's not just in one concentrated place. It's expected that it will be all over the state in this, the Western part of Oregon. And the damage will also range from moderate to extensive damage. And some of the damages that can happen considering the bridges that we have, existing bridges that we have, uh, is a lap splice failure because most of these bridges will have lap splices in the plastic hinge zone. And uh, a more severe could be river fracture and to be moderate or uh, a little bit less uh, damage could be extensive spalling, cover spalling and also barbuckling. So these are the damage that are expected from the Cascadia subduction zone earthquake. Uh, and again, uh, these are the existing bridges uh, that are potentially uh, vulnerable to Cascadia subduction zone earthquake because these bridges were built before 1970s and back, back in time, there was no seismic code or uh, there was uh, the design of these bridges were not followed uh, using any seismic codes. And these are essentially designed for uh, carrying the gravity loads. So lateral system is not present there. And hence, uh, we try to figure out how or what we can do if there are uh, damages resulting from the cascade of subduction zone. So, uh, what are the options that we have to repair these bridges? Uh, if we go for the conventional repair methods, we essentially use uh, the principles that we, we, can, we can enlarge the section of the plastic hinge region that is uh, expected to uh, get damaged under earthquake loadings and also uh, providing some sort of confinement using concrete jacketing. It could be steel encasing, which is a very popular uh, re uh, retrofit method uh, right now. And also there is uh, more advanced techniques of FRP wrapping, uh, which is also rapid and at the same time is effective as well. However, all of these conventional retrofit or repair techniques has potential problems. One of the problems is that if we have significant or extensive damage in a bridge column, we might expect that the river longitudinal river in the specimens or in the bridges, they will either buckle or fracture. So we have to find some sort of way to continue those river and anchor them to the footing. And that is oftentimes labor intensive and takes a lot of time. And also it's very difficult to continue, the, to make the river continuous uh, after the damages. And even if we do so at the end of the day, we will see there'll be several earthquakes that won't be the last earthquake. So we'll expect earthquakes in the futures and also aftershock earthquakes. And if we have cascaders subduction during earthquake, the aftershock will be even uh, significant earthquakes. So in any aftershock earthquake, we might expect damage uh, in the zones where we 
haven't done anything or we haven't uh, intervened and uh, strengthened any part of the bridge, columns, or the footings of whatever is left untreated could potentially damage in future earthquakes. So that doesn't essentially uh, give us the resilience that we need under future earthquakes. And also, if we increase uh, the st uh, like uh, the enlarge the sections or uh, somehow confine too much, it can increase stiffness, and that can essentially uh, shift the damage to other parts of the bridges, and that is also not desirable from a repair perspective. So that leads us to finding a new solutions uh, for repairing these uh, uh, bridges, and the new solution uh, essentially uh, considering uh, the objective that we should achieve resilience, which is the bridge will sustain the damage in an earthquake and it will also be uh, uh, damage free so that any future earthquake that we can expect, we don't have to go every time and uh, repair the bridge every time there is an earthquake. So that is one objective. And the other objective is to have the repair rapid so that we can go very quickly and repair the earthquake damage bridges. So we are prepared for an aftershocks uh, and also cost economy. Uh, we have to find a solution that is uh, economic, economically viable and is cheap, essentially. So from that perspective, uh, the dissipative comfort walking connections, uh, was uh, we considered that as a potential uh, that we can essentially implement in case of repairs. So that in case of dissipative comfort walking connections, essentially we have a recentering capabilities or recentering component of the displacements. Uh, which we can achieve with the existing XL loads that is acting on the bridges. And in further, in advance, uh, most of the uh, uh, concept where we use this year, we usually use post tension uh, to add uh, more recentering capabilities. And also, there will be uh, external dissipators or internal, it could be internal dissipators as well, that will allow the dissipation of that quick energy. So the advantage of external dissipators or the internal dissipators that's, that are exposed is that Every time an earthquake happens, we can essentially go into the bridge and change these dissipators that are external or internally uh, reachable uh, very easily. And once we replace those dissipators, the bridge essentially becomes a new bridge, not new repaired, and like it gains the strength or uh, uh, essentially immediately it uh, uh, achieves the strength that it needs to sustain the future earthquake. And so that is very advantageous. And Combining these uh, recentering capabilities and distribution capabilities, we can achieve the so-called flagship uh, hysteretic curves, which uh, is desirable for new construction and essentially also for repair purposes. So that was the objective for us. Uh, however, in our research projects, we essentially uh, relied on the Excel loads that was acting on the bridges for the recentering capabilities, and we haven't added any post-tension uh, uh, rods or anything, or uh, post-tension the columns. So again, before I dive into the repair uh, 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 design or uh, repair concept, I just want to give you uh, details about the as-built specimens and what are the damages that we have seen in the as-built specimens. So these as-built specimens were essentially a full-scale specimens of a bridge column and a footing. Footing was part of the specimens and it was not a capacity protected uh, member just to facilitate the load. It was part of the specimens and it imitates uh, the existing footings that we have uh, in, in the bridges in Oregon. And the footings essentially have just one layer of reinforcement at the bottom. They, again, they are not designed to carry the uh, lateral loads or not designed to sustain the earthquake loads. And the columns essentially had just four longitudinal reverse, either for number eight, for number nine, or for number 10 reverse with transverse reinforcement that are number three and space very, very uh, wide spacings between transverse reinforcement, like 12 inches in most cases, and also left splices, uh, either moderate, short, or uh, like long left splices in the plastic hinge. So we tested the space immense is, uh, in its as well uh, conditions, and the footing was left a, in, the, uh, in the strong floor without any anchoring to the strong floor. Uh, uh, so you can see from this backbone curve that uh, there is significant spalling in the columns in one side, in the push directions. Uh, there is significant spalling in the columns plastic hinge zone in the top right corner pictures. And these achieve a strength uh, that is we expect uh, to develop when the column uh, can develop plastic hinge regions. However, if we go in the pull direction, 
you see the background curve shows almost uh, elastic and perfectly plastic line because in the pull direction, there was less axial load. And when we went to the pull direction, the footing had flexural cracks or vertical cracks. You can probably see on the right hand side corner, it's very difficult to see. But the footing essentially had cracks and it was uplifting a lot by at the end of uh, ductility eight cycles, we have seen the footing uplifting by 1.85 inches at the bottom. And you can see essentially the gap at the bottom between the uh, strong floor and the footing. And every time uh, it went to uh, carry the loads, there was no damage on the other side of the column and all the damages was being concentrated or, uh, in the a flexural crack at the footing and the crack opened by almost 0.76 millimeter, just close to one millimeter wide crack at the maximum loads. So essentially, if we, if I summarize, these specimens experienced column damages, significant spalling at the column in the post direction, as well as footing damages. So our repair objective, uh, based on the performance of this as well, uh, specimen, was to uh, uh, intervene with the column damages and also to find ways to restore the strength of the footing and provide a stable hysteretic response for the whole uh, subsequent specimens. So what we did, we essentially targeted the load slightly below this 45 kips because once we reach this 45 kip loads in the full direction, along with the excel load ratios that we had, uh, it will essentially crack the uh, footing. So we targeted the a repair specimen to have a uh, lateral strength of 44 kips, slightly below of what we uh, observed uh, in the as specimens. So I'll talk about now the repair, how we did repair. Again, we implemented the DCA connections uh, uh, and using external dissipators. And the DCA connections uh, uh, was the external dissipators was U-shaped flexural plates. So the sequence of the damages of the repair specimens was first uh, we need to uh, uh, cut the reverse at the base of uh, base of the column so that there is no continuations of the reverse and that will allow the rocking of the columns between the column and the footing interface. So that that's that's why we cut the reverse. And also it's very easier to cut the reverse after the damages. And we significantly uh, we essentially eliminate the need to continue the reverse, uh, somehow restore the reverse continuity. And that will essentially save us labor and skilled professionals and a lot of time as well. And uh, then the next step was to install the anchor rods. The anchor rods were epoxy anchor. These anchor rods were essential uh, to apply, uh, to install the uh, external dissipators. Uh, uh, and the next one, uh, we provided the confinement in the uh, plastic, so-called plastic engine, where we're expecting that uh, there might be more demand or the significant demand in the Bottom half, uh, bottom half of the columns. Uh, that's where we confined it with FRP wraps. And for the FRP wraps to be applied, we essentially prepared the surfaces by grinding the surfaces and then applying the FRP labs, uh, wraps. And finally, we installed these uh, dissipated uh, uh, energy dissipators, externally uh, uh, energy dissipators that are essentially uh, two angle sections. One of these angle sections were attached to the column and the other angle section was anchored to the footing. So any relative displacement between the column and the footing would then uh, causes a relative displacement between the, these two legs. And this relative displacement will be accommodated by the UFPs. In the next uh, PowerPoint, this is the uh, elaborations of the DCA connections. So you can see the FRP wraps. And again, just to mention that all of this was done in the lab without any skilled laborers or skilled professionals. We have done everything and not even with advanced materials, whatever was available to us. Uh, and so, yeah, so just to explain the DCA connection. So these are the hold downs that are anchored with epoxy anchored uh, threaded rods to the footings. There are four hold downs. And there are also hold downs in the column side as well. These are essentially L sections. And one side of the UFP or the UFP shape flexible place would be connected to the column side hold downs and the other side will be connected to the footing side hold downs. So any relative displacement between the column and the footing interface or the rocking at the column and footing interface will initiate the relative displacement between the hold down at the column side and the hold down at the footing side.
As a result, these UFPs, the two sides of the UFPs will have a rolling motion and that will dissipate the energy. And again, this is the footing block uh, and uh, the footing side hold downs and all I've discussed. And this is a closer look on the right side. You can see uh, the UFPs, how they're connected, uh, they're bolted. And uh, for rapid repair perspective, we can essentially have all of these connected uh, previously and kept in place. And as we see earthquake damages, we can just go into the bridges and just install these three anchor rods that goes into the footings and the other anchor rods goes, goes into the column size. And we can essentially tighten with the knots and we'll have already uh, uh, energy dissipators, external energy dissipators. And uh, this is the load uh, uh, setup. Uh, this was essentially the same as the as built specimens. We essentially had two actuators. One actuator was applying the lateral loads and other actuator was oriented in the vertical directions. Uh, the reason why we did so is because we uh, varied the axial load as well as we apply the lateral loads because uh, this was a replica of multi-column bridge bend, uh, essentially two column bridge bend. And whenever we have a multi-column bridge bend, we'll see due to the P-delta effect, there will be variation in axial loads uh, as the earthquake load uh, or earthquake displacement being applied. So this is the axial loading protocol. We can see on the right side top uh, graph, uh, which shows the variation of the axial loads. And the variation of the axial load was essentially proportional to the strength of the lateral strength of the column. And on the bottom side, we're uh, uh, show, I'm showing the uh, lateral uh, loading protocol, which is uh, the cascade subduction zone loading protocol. It was uh, developed at our lab. Uh, and it essentially uh, imitates the effect of long duration cascade subduction zone. And it's essentially, it has more number of half cycles than the traditional two cycle symmetric loading protocols. Uh, it's actually double the number of cycles uh, than the three cycle symmetric loading protocols. And uh, as we see, we haven't applied any post tensioning and also the footing was just left uh, on the uh, strong floors. So the results, I'll just give you first the overall overview of the results. So on the left side, we see the asbestos specimens after uh, displacement equality of eight, and we have seen extensive spalling in the columns, and uh, there was sign of river buckling as well. And with this asbestos specimens or with these existing bridge columns with the details, we have seen that once these concrete spalls off, the cover concrete spalls off, immediately we'll see buckling of the rivers because they don't have any sort of confinement to suffer from the lateral transverse reinforcement. So there was extensive swelling and numerous flexural cacks as well along the height of the column. And also we have seen, as I have shown earlier, there was significant uplift in the footing and cracking of the footing. Uh, there was extending from the bottom of the footing uh, to the uh, top of the footing. So this was the state of the damage, final state of the damage for the as -built specimens. And on the right side, the repaired specimens at the same displacement ductility level. We haven't seen any new cracks. Uh, the cracks that are here in the black, uh, black uh, marks, these are essentially existing cracks. We have seen a little bit of widening of these cracks, but essentially remained elastic. There was no plastic deformation in the columns. I will show that uh, in the later sections, uh, but there was no FRP rupture or loosening. There was a little bit of concrete crushing right here at the top of the first layer of FRPs, but that was so minimal that we don't need to intervene or do anything even uh, after the displacement activity of eight. And the footing was, and most importantly, the footing was stable. There was no uplifting once we applied the repairs because the strength that we have achieved with the repair specimen was less than the strength required to crack the footing. And that was the design objective as well. Uh, and so essentially at the end of the displacement activity with this repair uh, specimen, we essentially got the damaged free sub-assembly and all the plastic deformation was in fact uh, uh, concentrated at the U-shaped flexible plates or the uh, external dissipators. Now if I go to the uh, uh, hysteretic responses, I uh, hear the hysteretic responses for the as specimen on the left side and the historic responses for the repair specimen on the right side. And if you can see the historic response for as specimens, it, you can all uh, see that in the push directions, the top, uh, the top right corner, uh, the positive directions is the push directions. We have achieved higher strength 
because in the push directions, we were able to develop the column plastic hinges on the uh, push directions. But on the pull directions, there were flexural cracking at the footing that allowed uplifting. And as we go, we, it remained essentially plastic after at uh, one point. So that was not essentially the kind of historical response we expect or we want out of uh, elbow spacing or any space in essentially or any bridges. So after the repair, we essentially got a stable historical responses with both sides showing symmetric responses. However, the strain gain was different Asymmetric strain gain can be uh, observed between the push cycle and the pull directions. It's essentially because of the variation in the Excel loops. Uh, it has nothing to do with the uh, repair setup. The repair was essentially uh, symmetrical in the both spaces. So it, but it was due to the variation of the Excel loops that resulted in higher strength in the push directions, which was in fact uh, uh, experiencing higher Excel loops. And in the pull direction, it was experiencing lower exit loads, and that's why we achieved a low strength as well. And also, you can see from the repair specimen that we got quite a, quite a bit of recentering with just the exit loads of the columns that we have. And again, uh, specimens, if we are thinking about a new construction, we might probably have to go for post tensioning because the recentering capability essentially depends on the lateral strength and also the exit load level. So we have to in between whatever the existing the loads we have or the clamping forces we have and whatever the lateral strength we're uh, expecting uh, out of uh, repair spacing or uh, new constructions. But for this case, we essentially see a uh, significant recentering capability, at least uh, up to displacement ductility three, up to here, it was a significant recentering, uh, it shows significant recentering. And as we can see from the asbel specimen, there was significant strength degradation but with the repair specimens, it essentially did not degrade. There was a degradation a little bit, but it was very less strength degradation from the peak strength. And uh, if you compare the energy dissipations, I, I haven't uh, compared the energy dissipations in a, a like graphical form, but from the historic response, you can see uh, the energy dissipation in the push cycle for the as well specimen was definitely higher. Uh, but in the pool duration, if you consider both the cycles, the repair specimen would essentially uh, end up having higher energy dissipations compared to the asbel specimens. And the uh, uh, initial stiffnesses were also comparable. Uh, but uh, with the repair specimen, we got a little bit less initial stiffnesses. I will show that uh, in a little, a little uh, uh, slides. And uh, but again, uh, in the repair specimen, we have a reduced strength. But we have the control over the design of the repair. So if you want, in cases where you don't see uh, the footing was damaged and the column uh, was developed, uh, was able to develop the full plastic hinges, and you want to go and match the as built and higher strength, you can do that, and you have that control with, on the design aspect of it. So here is the backbone curve. Uh, the red la red one is the as built specimen, and the blue uh, one is the repaired specimens. And you can see the significant difference in the peak strength. Uh, our target strength was again 44 tips so that we can eliminate the uplifting and flexural cracking uh, or further extension of the flexural cracking of the coating. Uh, and we achieved uh, a peak lateral load in the push direction of 42 kips. And in the pull direction, the peak lateral load was 31 kips. And again, uh, in the pull direction, we achieved less strength because of the exit load variation and not necessarily because of the design aspect or uh, any problem in the design of the repair specimens. It was essentially due to the exit loads. And just to give you a reference, the exit load in the push directions was 9% uh, uh, exit load ratio. And in the pull direction, it was around 6% uh, exit load ratio. So which uh, essentially gives us 240 kips in the push direction and 160 kips in the pull directions. Uh, and again, uh, we have seen low uh, strength degradation, and here is a summary of the test results. For the as well space elements, we have seen the initial stiffness was 147 kip, inch, kip per inch, and for the repair specimen, it was 120 kip per inch. And the strength degradation on the last uh, column is with as well space elements, the strength degradation was 15% at displacement ductility 8, and for the repaired specimen, the strength degradation was 5%. And that was essentially due to, because at the higher displacement vector level, the exit load started reducing because of the nature of the exit loading protocol. 
And if you maintain the same level of exhale load, I guess the strength degradation would be far less uh, than 5% with the repair specimens. So I guess that's the one. And here also the comparison of the curvature. We looked at the curvatures for both the SBS specimen and also the repaired specimen to see what is the column doing after the repair. And if you look on the left side, this is the interface moment or rotation behavior. The top one is for the SBS specimen. And as you see, in the push direction, the column was developed uh, a full plastic hinges. And so we see significant moment and rotation in the push cycle for the SBS specimens. Whereas in the pull direction, the moment rotation was very less because the rocking was happening at the footing again. So we haven't seen that much uh, rotation between the interface between the column and the footing interface. But when we repaired this, uh, again, we see symmetrical moment rotations between the push and pull direction because the rocking was accommodated within the footing and the column interface. And both the sides showed symmetrical uh, uh, rotation uh, abilities. And again, you can see that there is no degradations uh, in the rotation capabilities. And if you go on the right side, this shows uh, the curvature profile and the height of the columns. The blue ones is the, for the S-built specimen, and the black one is for the, uh, sorry, the blue one is for the repair specimen, and the black one is for the S-built specimen. And this is essentially uh, reducing the bottom uh, uh, 10 inches of the columns because that for S-built specimen incorporate the strain penetration or the uh, fixed and rotation due to tens, strain penetration. So that's not essentially the flexible curvature. So I have deducted that part from the flexible curvature profile. But this is essentially the curvature profile from 10 inches. And you can see that for the as built specimen, it crosses uh, the yield uh, curvature and essentially shows that there are plastic curvatures in the push directions. And the dotted side is the pull directions. And uh, both the as built and the repair specimen showed that they never cross the yield curvature for the pull directions. Uh, but when we repaired, we can see that even in the push directions, the curvature in the column remained elastic. So there was essentially no plastic curvature in the columns after repairs. So we eliminated uh, uh, and we essentially uh, uh, reached our objective that the column should not experience any plastic deformation or plastic curvatures. And so there, there is no plastic damages in the columns, whatever the damages or whatever the displacement or flexural curvature in the column is essentially elastic so that it goes away once the load gets back to zero. OK, so the conclusion just to, uh, uh, this is a potential repair specimens that we can probably achieve. Uh, but there are some concerns over uh, this repair specimen is one of this is the corrosions. We have to think about how we can, uh, uh, since these are FRP uh, e flexible plates, uh, these are steel, uh, metal steel. So we, we have to think about the corrosions. And also, we can consider this as a potential retrofit. And another uh, recommendation for future studies is the development of a numerical model for this uh, so that we can capture the behavior uh, when we're going to implement these things. So that's the whole presentation. Thank you very much. If anyone has any questions, please ask. Thank you, Vala. Uh, the floor is open for questions. I don't see any question. Maybe I can ask you a quick question. When you're yes. applying the horizontal load, did you see any movement of the footing? Did you monitor that? Uh, yes, we did, uh, but there was no sliding because the exit load was so much uh, that we haven't seen any sliding of the footing. Okay. Uh, and when you applied the axial load, is it one from the actuator on the left and you also had vertical post tensioning on the right? Uh, so that's, that's essentially threaded rods and just mm -hmm. it just like to restrain this end. So once we apply the exit load with this actuator, mm -hmm. this end is just the restraining it. Okay, and so you restrained it after you pull it down. Uh, yeah, so it, it was like when we uh, set up this whole setup, we restrained it essentially at the very beginning. So as we go okay. the actual uh, actuator down, it mm -hmm. will restrain this end. So the objective of this was also to apply higher exit load than the actuator capacity. So the actuator mm -hmm. capacity was only 100 kips, but with this arrangement, we can we were able to apply 240 kips with the lever concept right. uh, at the column. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Golam, for your nice presentation.